I'd like to say again uh, what, what a great honor it is for me to have received the ABBA Prize, and in particular to share it with John Nash. Um, the talk I've, I've uh, uh, organized here is not meant for mathematicians. So I apologize in advance to, to the mathematicians in the audience and to experts and so on. It's going to be a very elementary thing. And in fact, I, I want to start first with a few comments about uh, some ingredients that I use in my research. Of course, Professor Riviere afterwards will talk in, in somewhat technical detail, I guess, about some of my work. And I just want to start with some simple ingredients and then go on to some other subjects. So, uh, as you know, partial differential equations, as was mentioned yesterday, enters in almost any field of science. When you try to express in mathematical terms, some model that you have, and it usually it comes up in terms of partial differential equations. So you look at functions and somehow relations between functions and derivatives, derivatives with respect to space or, or time. So, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, this is the first time I've ever used PowerPoint, so I'm not at all used to it. Lo and behold, yes. <laughs> the, um, so, uh, besides uh, uh, make, uh, applying partial differential equations to problems in geometry and complex analysis and so on, I've also worked on the theory of the equations themselves. For instance, do solutions exist? In general, you cannot write down specifically a solution. You use, sometimes you can use computers to compute very good approximations to solutions, but sometimes somebody comes up with a mathematical model of some problem, some partial differential equation, and it turns out it doesn't have solutions at all. There are e equations that don't have solutions. So part of the problem is, given some model, that, that, are there solutions? Are the solutions regular? Are they unique? What properties can you show for the solutions? Maybe some kind of symmetry or monotonicity or things like that. So these are things that you want to investigate. And, forgive me. Uh, now, a, a basic tool in attacking, so there, do solutions exist? A basic tool in attacking them are inequalities. So, uh, as I said, you don't know the solutions precisely. What you try to get is some information about them, some order of magnitude of their size, or the size of their derivatives. How big are the derivatives? Can you get upper bounds? Can you get lower bounds? These, it, not just out of curiosity, but you, you, you have to make use of such information in trying to prove the existence of a solution. So one, one class of inequalities are so-called interpolation inequalities. These don't refer particularly to solutions of partial differential equations. Rather, they refer to functions themselves, and they are of the following kind of nature. Suppose you have an estimate for the functions, and you have an estimate for derivatives of, say, 10th order. For some, somehow, you have got an estimate for 10th order derivatives. Interpolation inequalities say, if you know those two kinds of estimates, you can estimate the size of the derivatives in between. So you may wonder, well, who cares? Well, in, in, in the theory, in attacking partial differential equations, such inequalities are, turn out to be extremely useful. So um, I'd like to discuss a standard way uh, that one attacks a nonlinear problem. So here is a nonlinear differential equation. You don't see any derivatives because I haven't written that down any. So it's a relationship, capital F, between the, your, your spatial or, or space or time, whatever it is, variables, and then the function or collection of functions you are looking at, and some of their derivatives. And you have some relation that says all of that combination it should be zero or perhaps something else on the right. You may have a number of such relations, more than one. And the question is, you're looking, trying to attack such a, a problem. Now, you might have 
additional conditions on the side. For instance, if you're looking at a, a region in space, you might have conditions on the boundary. Or if you're looking at a problem involving time, then you might have conditions at some initial time as well as on the boundary, and you're looking for solutions satisfying these additional conditions. And the standard way of attacking such a problem, it's nonlinear, it's a hideous looking mess, is to, what's that? Oh, I'm pushing the wrong button, sorry. Is to use what's called the continuity method. What that is, is you embed the problem in a one parameter family of problems. You say you have a parameter T, which goes, say, from zero to one, and you have a collection, a whole collection of problems depending smoothly on T. And so you take a given problem, you embed it in a whole family so that at t equals zero, you, this is a known problem and you have a known solution. So you start with a known problem, which you connect to the original problem by a whole family. So at time t equals one, you're, you have your original problem. And the question is, can you solve it for each t? You have a solution for t equals zero, you start from there, you want to move t progressively, and for every t you want to be able to solve. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there are two crucial steps. Oh, I keep pushing the wrong button. There are two crucial steps that you have to deal with. And the first is a so-called openness. And what that means is if for some particular value of t, which I called t bar, I think, if I can read it, you want to prove that for t close to that value, for every t close to that value, there is a solution. So, you, so this step says, suppose for some t bar you have a solution, do you also have solutions for, nobody, for neighboring t's, t's close? And so the uh, standard way to attack that is to, uh, is to li linearize the problem. That came too fast, one moment. Let me get rid of that. Uh -huh. Yeah, a, a standard way to attack that is to say, well, uh, I want to look at a neighboring problem. Let me look at a linearized approximation of the problem near there. I won't explain exactly what that means, but it's some kind of approximation problem. And if I can solve that approximation linear problem nicely with e nice estimates on derivatives, then I should be able to solve the problem for, all, for neighboring t. But at this point, I'd like to make a side remark. And what often happens is that when you solve the linearized problem, you may lose some derivatives. You start off with functions with having derivatives up to order 10. And then you, maybe your original thing at time t bar, you know you have a solution having derivatives up to order 10, and you want to stay within that class. Then you look at the linearized problem, and maybe you can solve that, but you get a solution only with derivatives up to order 7. Maybe it doesn't have more derivatives. You're losing derivatives. Then this procedure just doesn't work. And people never knew how to attack a, a problem where you lose derivatives. Just, it just seemed impossible. But one of the great remarkable things that Nash did, and here, so here this is a side remark, not connected with what I was saying. Nash introduced in his isometric embedding problem, not the one that uh, Delilis was discussing where you have just a C1 embedding, a very rough embedding, but he had a, a, a wonderful paper with a smooth embedding. You have any, any manifold, any re region with, where you can measure distance, and the question is, can you realize that as a kind of surface in some Euclidean space, maybe of high dimension? And he solved that problem, and in the process of it, he was, had to do an, a linear approximation to an approximate solution, and there, he, there was a loss of derivatives. And of course, there everybody was stuck. What do you do with loss of derivatives? But what Nash did, he introduced his famous smoothing procedure. There was a, an iterator step that he did to solve the problem, and at each step you tend to lose derivatives, but at each step he smoothed out the solution. He did a smoothing procedure. And 
at each step of iteration, the smoothing got better and better. So that there was a, a fight between smoothing and loss of derivatives. And that technique, I found that paper to be one of the most remarkable papers of analysis of the last century, I must say. And now it's called the Nash-Moser method because Moser then put it in a more somewhat more abstract framework, but the essential idea was a smoothing idea. And it's just, to my mind, a, a fantastic, fantastic thing. Okay, this, the next step, I go back to the continuity method. The next step is, first step was the openness, the next step is called the closeness, which is this. Suppose you have a sequence of solutions for T, you know solutions for T, not a sequence, you know solutions UT for values of all T up to some T bar less than some T hat, and now the, the closeness says, let's prove there's a solution for T hat. And the standard way to do this is to show if you take a sequence of these known solutions, T, TJs, that T1, T2, 3, and so on, and the corresponding solutions, and the Ts are, are approaching this T hat, you want to show that these solutions converge to, together with their derivatives to some function, and that function will then be a solution for T hat. So that's this, this step, the closing step, is to show convergence of a family of solutions. And for that, the inequalities are estimates on the solutions and the derivatives are absolutely essential. So here inequalities play an extremely crucial role. You have to be able to look at these solutions. When I say look at them, you don't see them. But you, 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 they're, you're assuming you have these solutions and you say, well, can I estimate them? And you don't even know that what the solutions are. You're assuming that you ha they're there and you want to estimate to show that some sequence will converge to something which will then give a solution for the, the T bar, that's the limited one. So estimates play an absolutely crucial role and they're called a priori estimates because you assume a priori that these solutions are there. You don't know that they're there but you're assuming you have solutions for values of T below T bar, T hat, and you want to catch solution of T hat using convergence. So these are two very crucial steps. Now, a very important tool in getting estimates is the so-called maximum principle. What that says is that if you have solution in, in some region in domain of, uh, usually it's for a linear equation. So linear means, before I wrote down relationship between U and derivatives, here it's a relationship which just depends in a linear way on U and its derivatives. This does not mean L times U. L is just some relationship acting on U, some operator acting on U. Never mind, it's some lin linear object. And uh, the, the maximum principle says if you have a solution of that, then its maximum occurs on the boundary of the domain. So if you have information on the boundary, at, such as the size of the solution on the boundary, the maximum principle tells you, aha, I have a, a good estimate for the solution inside. That's a good first step. Okay, and what's very important also is to have the same kind of step if U solves an inequality. That is, the operator on U is not just zero, but greater than or equal to zero. That's a very useful thing to know if you have a maximum principle for solutions of that, of an inequality. And it's true for a certain class of operators. It's not true for all operators. Where am I? Yes. Uh, so, for example, in one dimension, so here we are in one dimension, x is one variable, u is the function, it's, it's represented by a graph. If the graph looks like that, that's a sort of convex figure, then it, that satisfies the maximum principle. Its maximum occurs at this point on the boundary of the region where it's defined. And so there you have the maximum principle. And it, it doesn't satisfy, an, an, it satisfies an inequality. Here is the inequality, it says that the second derivative of u with respect to that variable is non-negative, is greater than or equal to zero. That's the expression of that this is a convex object. 
in higher dimensions, I'm just going to write something down, but uh, if you haven't had calculus, or even if you had calculus, you have forgotten calculus, the, the, uh, here it involves, you have a function of two variables, x1 and x2, and these are second derivative in x1, second derivative in x2, and something linear combination of first derivatives and something times u. If you have an inequality at every point, and if that coefficient has a good sign, then the u satisfies the maximum principle. So that's an example in two dimensions of the maximum principle. So this is all I'm going to say about uh, my work in partial differential equations, because as I said, Professor Riviere, oh, how am I doing for time? How much time do I have? Can you tell me how many minutes? I, sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Oh, you mean one or two more minutes? Yeah. Or more? <laughs> one or two. Okay, because I have two topics. So it's a question of how much time. If it's one or two minutes, then I'll stay with this topic. But the, the last topic is a fascinating topic. <laughs> and, and if you want to hear it, then you, you have to come with us to the next town. Because I hope there to have time to do it. So in this, I'm going to turn now to a subject of which I'm very ignorant. But it's number theory, one of, one of the oldest subjects in, in mathematics, studying integers. And uh, it, uh, in particular, one studies primes. You know, primes form the basis of integers. A prime, if you're, if you're, let me remind you, for those who have forgotten, is an integer, a whole number of which only one and the integer itself divide that number, like five, seven, 11, 13, and so on. And there's a very old problem. Of course, you, you know that Andrew Wiles solved the Fermat's last theorem, but I'm not going to talk about that. But there's another very old problem, which is unsolved, and it's called the twin prime conjecture. And that, prob that problem is the following. Uh, it it's conjectures that there are infinitely many pairs of primes which differ, one of which differs from the other by, the, by two, like five and seven, not, uh, 11 and 13, 17 and 19, they differ by two. This conjecture says there are infinitely many such pairs. And many people have attacked this problem. It's still a wide open problem. But, two year, uh, but in fact, nobody even knew if you replace the number two separate by two, by a thousand. Could there be infinitely many pairs w whose d difference between the two is, say, less than a thousand? Nobody could prove that, that for any number, there, there are infinitely many such pairs. But two years ago, a completely unknown Chinese man living in America, age 58, proved that there are infinitely many pairs of primes which differ from each other by a number less than, one second. Uh, ah, no, I, that's, uh, sorry, I, that's the subject. Yes, that's the subject at which you're not going to hear about, <laughs> moonshine. Fantastic. Moonshine in, in, uh, in America, I'll just say, means, uh, it's of course a shine of the moon. It also means illegal liquor. But the moonshine here doesn't, is not connected with the liquor. So, but let me go back to the twin prime conjecture. What, what he proved, this person, his name is Li, Li Tang. Let me just find his name one moment. Uh, uh, oh, I left out a whole subject. Never mind. Okay, my memory, is my time up? Okay, time's up. So anyway, th what he proved is, I'll just say in one sentence, is that there are infinitely many primes such that they differ from each other by a number less than, where is that number? Uh, 70 million. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's what he proved. There are infinitely many pairs of primes which differ from each other by less than 70 million. 
and he was completely unknown. And then, of course, many people immediately jumped on this, what he had done, because he introduced new ideas. That 70 million has now been reduced to 246. Yeah, and now people are trying to reduce it to two, of course, to solve the, the prime con twin prime conjecture, but my time is up. Thank you very much.